I am happy to introduce Beth Ennis from Bella <laughs> Bellerman University. <laughs> Sorry, um, we're go I'm going to cut the intro short so um, she has enough time to get through all of her information this afternoon. Um, the aquatic section is happy to have her here today. All right, have a good time. Okay. <laughs> I've been told I have a restriction for movement, which is going to be an issue. So if you see me kind of go, uh, it's because I can't go past here, um, which I'm a pacer. I know a lot of our other presenters are pacers, and that's a challenge for us. So I apologize right now for any start-stop movement that I do, and welcome to Friday afternoon. Um, I have discovered rule number 27 about presenting, never follow a round table, because there's some pretty heated discussion, and then people leave to go continue that discussion in the hallway. So I'm thrilled that there are this many people in the room, A, on a Friday afternoon, the last day of the conference, B, after lunch, and C, following that round table. Um, I am from Louisville, Kentucky. That's where Bellarmine University is. That is the home of the Kentucky Derby. Don't come visit us during May. It's really ugly. There's a lot of people there, and they're doing crazy things. But any other time of the year is fabulous to come visit, and there's racing going on all over the place. So um, we're going to be talking about autism which is a really hot area, and I didn't realize quite how hot. Um, I'm a pediatric therapist. I've been practicing for a while. I was a special educator before that, and didn't see a lot of autism early in my PT career. As time went on, I tried to avoid <laughs> working with children with autism because it wasn't my thing. I was a neonatal specialist. I worked with early intervention. I liked that stuff. This was hard. But the universe kept hitting me over the head and saying, no, these guys need us too. Um, and we get left out a lot when we're looking at movement in these kids. Everyone knows they need speech. A lot of times they get OT. They're getting a lot of ABA. But we've kind of ignored the motor side of these kids. And we have more and more showing up in the literature that supports the fact that, yes, they really do need us. And what we've discovered and what I'm going to share with you is that the pool is a fabulous place to work with these kids. And I see a lot of heads nodding, so I know I'm preaching to the choir, which is fabulous. Um, we're going to talk about some of the issues that we see with these children. Um, I relate to the ICF model because I am one of those obnoxious university people. Um, but if any of you were here for the last discussion, I do teach aquatics in our curriculum. And you're going to see some of that here. Um, we're also going to talk about how that disability impacts their participation and why we can use this to help increase that participation level and get them back into community activities. Um, we're going to talk about some of those activities. We're going to go through some of the very small amount of literature that's out there on kids with autism spectrum and aquatics. Um, and again, how to use it not only therapeutically, but as a way to re-engage them in the community. So this is what the dsm 4 diagnoses look like right now. Um, they are talking, and I'm, yeah, there it is. This is going to stay, this is going to stay. They're talking about this one going away in the DSM-5. So there's a lot of discussion right now about what that autism spectrum is actually going to look like. And Asperger's will not be a separate category if it goes to print as published currently. Um, classic things that we know of in these children, social interaction is impaired, communication is impaired. Um, less communication on the Asperger's side of things, but certainly more on the autistic side of things. A lot of those repetitive behaviors, spinning everything, flipping everything, um, some of the stereotypic responses that we see in these kids. It does show up in early childhood. Um, what we're seeing in the literature is almost two different tracks for how it's showing up. We're seeing kids that are showing signs in infancy and continue to get more severe as they get older. And then we're seeing the kids who appear to be looking fine until a certain point somewhere in that second year of life, and then all of a sudden start regressing. And I don't know that we know enough about what's behind this disorder or the series of disorders to say which kids are going to follow which path. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we're seeing in the literature, and some of what I'll share with you is supporting that as well. The other thing that has to be present is that all of these issues that they're showing have to impair their daily function. And certainly, if you're having trouble communicating or interacting with a person in front of you, that's going to limit your daily function. So again, we see these, but we also see, and I'm going to try and speed through some of this because I was just told I have less time than I thought I did, so bear with me. Um, 
we always think 18 months. 15 to 18 months, the switch flips, and all of a sudden they start st showing characteristics. They're doing studies on infants in the NICU now <laughs> and seeing signs of asymmetry, both in visual attention and in motor, um, and impaired and altered tone in their upper extremities in kids who are later going on to be diagnosed on the spectrum. So we do see signs in infancy that should give us a heads up, maybe not that the child's going to be diagnosed, but that we need to be watching them and working with them. Um, and what they saw was, by four months of age, the kids with autism, that ended up on the autism spectrum later were showing a preference for needing more input to interact with the world than their typical peers did at the same age. Okay, so it's really early that we're starting to see some things. Um, this was a study done in the first five months of life. It's getting a little old, but they're starting to repeat some of these. And this one, they looked at three categories. They looked at children who were diagnosed on the spectrum. They looked at children with developmental delays. And then they looked at typically developing peers. And they were doing video analysis. So they were looking back at retrospective videotapes that the parents had done and sent in. And they were looking for any difference but they were blindly coded. So they were looking at it and saying, okay, how is this infant moving? How is this infant moving? How is this infant moving? And what they saw was the kids that were diagnosed on the spectrum had less symmetrical movement than both the developmental delay kids and their typical peers. But those spectrum kids, again, fell into two different groups. In that level of asymmetry, there was a high less symmetry group and a low less symmetry group. So even within that, there were some differences that they were seeing. But again, they were seeing them in five, at the first five months of life. So a lot of these folks, we could pick up earlier, we could do some things with. I don't know, we can't not have them have autism, <laughs> but maybe we can reduce some of the impairments that we're seeing later on. Uh, these two studies were done in children who were school age, late elementary school age, and what they were looking at was bilateral coordination and motor planning. And again, your kids on the spectrum were having trouble with some of those bilateral symmetrical tasks and unilateral stance tasks, doing things with the different sides of their body at the same time, hopping, skipping, jumping, jumping jacks, all of that kind of stuff they had more difficulty with. And the scores that they were seeing, and I'm trying to remember which tool they used. Anyway, um, the kids on the spectrum were testing at half the age of their typical peers. So when, if they were 12 years old, they were performing at the level of a six-year-old. Okay. And I mean, these are kids that walk, <laughs> you know, so they're, they're functional. But quality of movement issues and motor planning tend to be a big, big problem. Um, other things that they've seen, these were infant studies. And I've heard this anecdotally from a lot of families. Gee, the baby never nursed well. We had to go to a bottle. They seemed a little floppier when they were born, but they kind of perked up a little bit, so we didn't worry about it. Um, some of these subtle things that we hear about later on are also showing up in the literature. So a lot of these kids do have oral motor dysfunction as well as motor coordination in their extremities. They do have difficulties with motor planning. And so those are some of the things that um, if you're in early intervention or if you're seeing children who are very young, you can start looking for not, again, to diagnose them with something, but to say, gee, we need to hit this early so that we're not teaching a 12-year-old how to do a jumping jack <laughs> or to hop, skip, or jump. Um, this was a really interesting study because it looked at kind of the processing piece. And I've often said working with these kids that they just think differently. There's something going on that they're processing differently and how does that happen and what's going on and we don't know. <laughs> I wish we did. Um, but this particular study said there is some kind of model in our brain that helps us figure out how to move. And it's comes from experience, it comes from how we're taking in information, it comes from the signals our brain is sending down, and we need to be able to generate that. And we get that from proprioception, we get that from visual information, and we get it from movement experience. And a lot of these kids don't have a lot of good visual information because they're not making good eye contact with the world. They have a very limited sphere of influence when it comes to vision. They're not moving a lot because they're kind of scared to. It's, it's a little frightening to move out of that base when you're not real coordinated. So they tend to be very unilateral in their movement. And so getting that going, giving them more visual information, getting them to pay more attention to where they are in space, giving them more proprioceptive information can help that internal model to develop. We don't know how. <laughs> this came up in the scuba talk yesterday that I just absolutely fell in love with. 
what is it about water that influences all of these things? And I don't know how we'd study it. So if any of you have ideas, let me know. <laughs> okay? But that's part of what we're trying to deal with. Now, this one was in the Journal of Physical Therapy last year. Um, it was a um, review of all the studies on motor and children with autism. And I absolutely adore this, this review because they really looked at the early influences and what we see early on and what gets missed. Um, they're not obvious delays. They're subtle. They're qualitative. So it really does take folks who know what they're doing to look at that movement pattern and say, eh, something's not right. Um, the other thing that they highlighted that I absolutely love and that I beat into my students' heads on a routine basis is, you know what? We can't separate motor development from language development, from cognitive development, from social development. They're intertwined. And so with these kids that have social and language delays, if we can use movement not only to get them better at moving, but to influence those other areas, we're getting more bang for our buck. Okay. Um, they were looking at a lot of recommendations for follow-up. So even when you have a child that has some subtle motor stuff going on and you think they're looking good and you discharge them, can't we have some kind of mechanism, and with these days of funding, it's hard to do, to check in with them six months from now and say, what's going on now? Are things still moving in the right direction? How are they going? Um, and they stress that this is even more important when you have siblings of children who have been diagnosed on the spectrum because they're at a high risk of having issues too, even if it's not fully landing on the spectrum. Okay. I'm preaching to the choir with this slide. <laughs> Why water? Right? It's fabulous. We love it. It works well. All of those properties that we have been talking about for the last two days are what we're going to use to influence these children. Okay? That hydrostatic pressure, I think, is probably the biggest piece for this population because it's constantly giving them input over every surface of their body about where they are in space. And it's just giving them that information as they move, as they stand still. And you'll see some of the challenges with that to start with, but some of the real benefits that we see later on. Plus, we can do some strengthening. A lot of these kids also have real bad core weakness. You know, they're clumsy kids. And so the more we can get them stronger, the more we can work on balance, the more we can work on bilateral coordination, the better they're going to do. Um, the studies that specifically looked at aquatics with these kids are showing not only improvement in physical skills, and this was a surprise to me because I found it too, an improvement in the social skill while they're in the water. And it's carrying over onto land. Um, so that just reinforces that tie. My big push as a therapist, I tell families I want to work myself out of the job. I don't want them to need me. They shouldn't have to come to therapy once a week for the rest of their life. I want them engaged in activities in the community that are going to be therapeutic, but are also going to get them into the community so that they can be a part of it and not be isolated. And swimming is a huge one. Although we were talking earlier in the session, the round table, about the fact that that's kind of disappearing and we need to bring it back as a social activity. Um, the first, we've been fortunate to work in three different pools, and it really was just what do we have? <laughs> because we ran this out of the university. Our university does not have a pool. So we went to the community, and at the time when we ran the first part of this study, um, we had the therapeutic pool at the community rec center that they allowed us to rent <laughs> um, on Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. So for eight weeks on Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, that was our pool. And the little old ladies didn't like it because we kicked them out. Um, but it was a warm water therapeutic pool. Uh, the second pool that we were able to use was at an ICF in our town um, that was underutilized by their residents, and they wanted to get people in it. So we had an agreement with them. They let us use it for free. It was really nice. But that pool was 96 degrees because you had residents who were wheelchair bound, pretty dependent. And so when they were in the pool, they needed a higher temp to reduce tone, relax, all of those kinds of things. We had about 45 minutes, and then we had red-faced, sweaty kids. So uh, we've moved on. But those were the first two places we were able to work. I'm also fortunate in that I have students who are a fabulous resource as volunteer bodies. Uh, so if any of you are thinking about doing something like this in your community, if you have a program nearby, 
It gets the students in the water. It gets them utilizing some aquatic therapy principles and techniques that they might not be exposed to. And you've got somebody can, that you can do one-on-one -on -one with. So we'd have maybe five kids in the pool at a time, but they'd have at least one student, if not two, with them all the time. So we were doing individualized groups, if that makes any sense at all. Um, that let us do some interaction between the kids, which was great to work on those social skills and turn taking and all of those kinds of things. But they also got focused attention on what they needed. Um, so the programs were pretty individualized. We have done anywhere from eight to 10 weeks, really haven't seen a difference um, in that amount of length, and generally 50 minutes to an hour. Again, depending on the pool temp, if they got hot and sweaty, they got out. <laughs> Um, we started with this kind of um, scenario not being locked into activities, but just having a framework for the students to follow so that they remembered, we need to work on respiratory and breath support as much as we need to work on bilateral coordination. So be thinking about bubble blowing activities, ping pong ball blowing activities, as well as monkey walking on the wall, rocket blasts, those kinds of things. Um, we evolved from that. Uh, you'll see up there, there's a thing that says squirt gun. Yeah, <laughs> that was a suggestion from one of the student groups because, and it was a fabulous idea. They were thinking, gee, we have small rings, we have squirt guns, it can work on eye-hand coordination, shoulder stability, it can be a target. Okay, you're giving young children a squirt gun. <laughs> I don't care where they are on the spectrum. They may shoot at the target twice and then they're gonna aim at everything else in the pool. So the squirt guns went away after the first round of this, but everything else pretty much stayed um, I'm going to show you some pictures in a few minutes, different activities that we came up with along the way that the, the students got creative, we got creative. Um, I had a PTA working with me for a while as well so that we could, one, be on the deck taking pictures while the other was in the water with the students. Um, the other piece that has changed, and I'm going to show you a picture of where we are now because we have another residential facility in town that's a not-for-profit that built a pool and said, please come use it. And we said, okay. What they built, let's see if it's here, is a uh, zero depth entry. There's a lift over here. It's four feet. It has snoozle and equipment in it. So there are lights in the water. There's music in the water. There are projectors that project images all around it if you want them on. Uh, there's a splash wall on the deck. There are fountains that can go into the pool. It's saltwater UV. Um, which is really nice for our kids who are a little sensitive to different things. And it's usually, even though, I mean, you can see it's pretty hot. You don't even see the ceiling up here. But I don't know what acoustic tiles they used. We don't get sound bounce. So my kids on the spectrum don't freak out when they first come in. Now, I will tell you that the community pool we first used had amazing reverb. I mean, it was awful. But they did okay, and it had a tin roof. So when we were in during a thunderstorm, even though there was no lightning and we could stay in the water, you got this constant ping, 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 ping. They ignored it once they were in the water. It was pretty amazing. Um, the other thing we have changed is we are now having parents get in the pool with us. Who designed that? Who designed that? Um, the therapist that works at that pool sat down with um, Flag House, who does the snoozle and stuff, a pool company and the UV and saltwater people, and it took them about a year to hammer out the whole design. That's cool. It's fabulous. I, <laughs> we, we lucked out. What's the name of the pool? Innocence. Home of the Innocents. I'm sorry, repeat the question. <laughs> so bad at this. Um, he asked the name of the pool. It's called the Home of the Innocents, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T-S in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I believe it's homeoftheinnocents.org, and then if you quick, click on programs, it'll take you to the Aquatic Center. Um, the other nice thing is they have opened it to the public. So they have punch cards for folks who want to come in. They do community classes for folks with MS, arthritis, Parkinson's, um, in addition to using it for the kids that live there. So they've really done a, a fabulous job with that. Um, as I said, we've invited parents to get in because with the first two iterations of this, we discovered that while the kids did really well, and I'll share that data with you in a minute, um, the, there was no follow through. <laughs> Once it was done, it was done. Um, I work with a lot of kids with a lot of disabilities. And one of the things that I notice with my parents is that they are tired. 
They have a lot going on. They need a break. They're overwhelmed. And if I let them, they will sit. You know? But if I get them in the water with their child and give them something when they leave that says, here are the things your child can do in any pool, anywhere, they're more likely to follow through with that. And some of that um, I'll talk about in a minute. We have generally done eight-week sessions, although this year we're down to three weeks. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Um, the first challenge is getting the kids in the pool. <laughs> Those who have been in the water before, we can't keep them out. But the kids who have never been in a pool before, it can be a challenge sometimes because that is a lot of pressure all at once. It's a lot of information. And it can be really overwhelming to their system as it's processing. So we have done gradual entry down the stairs. We have done scooting down the ramp. Generally, you know, it's, it's a zero depth ramp, so it takes 100 feet to get in all the way into the pool. Um, we've used the splash zone on the side and done wet towels around them just to get them comfortable and get them in. Now, I will tell you, once we get them in, we can't get them out because they love it so much. Um, I, I really wish I could have gotten a picture because 90% of the kids we've had in this program have done this, but I'm too busy fishing them out. They get in there and they go under. And they just look up at you and smile. And you see these eyes blinking and this grin, and you're like, no, you need to breathe. <laughs> and I haven't been able to get a picture because we have been fishing them out. But they love that pressure so much they want to be under. And we've actually had to use float belts to keep kids on the surface once they're in there. So things that you might encounter. But getting them in at first can be a, a little bit of a challenge. This little girl I absolutely adore. Um, she was a little higher on the spectrum. A lot of echolalia, but she was verbal. Music was her thing. And so she would get in the pool and do whatever we asked her to do as long as we allowed her to sing. And she would go through entire songs and then finish with the tagline that the radio uses. <laughs> so she would be singing along, and we'd be dancing with her and doing our thing. And, and she'd be, a love song by Sarah Bareilles. And then she'd go into the next song. <laughs> and it was just it was amazing to watch. But I mean, she just went right along. Whatever we asked her to do, she would do it. And that was how she kind of kept herself going. Um, and so you'll see some things like that. We do some wall walking, and I've got some video. And this is just monkey walking along the edge. Again, trying to work on that bilateral coordination. And I know it's dark. I apologize. But you see this little guy. You can see his arms. He's like, no, I'm going to walk on the bottom. And really has trouble figuring out that progression of the arms, let alone getting the legs on top of the pool. Now, I just wanted to leave this piece in here for the eye contact part. We get it eventually. And then we're off. Um, I wish I had video of this. With some of our kids, we were able to work on sequencing and multi-step directions by putting an underwater obstacle course together. So we would say we have big flexible swim rings that are like hula hoops, but you can take them apart and dump them out. Swim through the hoop and get the toy. Two steps. And then, OK, you need to swim through one hoop, two hoop, get the toy. And then we'd add, then bring it back to me. And usually within five to six weeks, they could not only remember all of that sequence, but do it. Uh, there were times where they had difficulty getting under the water. We had one little guy, and I wish I had video of it, he tried so hard to duck and swim, and he was just so buoyant that his little tush just kept coming up to the surface, and he couldn't get through the ring. So we'd <coughs> add a little effort to help him, and then he made it through and came up and was happy as a clam. Um, another sequencing piece, and this is one of our young ladies who is actually 13. Um, she was fortunate enough to be a one, one participant to four students. And so they surrounded her and said, okay, catch, now toss to me. Now catch, now toss to you. Now catch, now toss back here. And if you watch, she has figured out that if she flings that ball, and I think it's coming right here, it won't come back to her so quickly. So she's got time to get settled and figure out where she's got to go next. That was the first day she was in the water. By the third day she was in the water, she could do a four toss catch sequence in different directions and not lose her balance and not want to go under and really maintain the task, which was nice to see. Uh, we do a lot of propulsion. 
um, for a number of reasons. One, lower extremity strength. Two, get that core going. Um, three, movement through space. Because <laughs> a lot of these kids really struggle just with that whole movement through space piece. And so they jump from lap to lap. They jump off of a wall. There's a, an 18 inch depth wall in the corner of that pool as well. So if we have littles, they can do some weight bearing. Um, but we also use it as a jump off because you're not allowed to jump off the side into the pool. Um, some of the core stability things that we're doing. Whoops, come back. Hello. There it is. We use float mats pretty liberally. We also use kickboards pretty liberally. We try to stick with things that the parents will be able to find at a community pool that's doing some kind of aquatic exercise um, so that they can replicate them. He's crawling up the ramp. Um, <laughs> you're going to see in a minute one of the other challenges we ran into, which was dropping suits. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is about our young men and tying them up, but we had a lot of crack problems. <laughs> Um, this is a little boy using the kickboard um, for core. Where is my mouse? There it is. And so first he wanted to stand on it. <laughs> no. And there's the swimsuit issue. But when we got him sitting on it, and this one is actually one of the curved board. It's not a flat one. We could do some perturbation work in different directions. And he was another one that we had to alternate activities. If he would do this for us, we'd let him go under because he didn't want to be above the water. He liked to be underneath. Um, we didn't want to neglect respiratory and breath support. So we did a lot of bubble blowing. We actually did have bubbles in the pool. Um, but we also did ping pong ball races, which is really cheap and easy. <laughs> Um, and competitive, which they loved. Now he's cheating. He keeps grabbing his ping pong ball and throwing it forward. But eventually he got it. And it's hard when you've got five kids in the pool and the water's moving everywhere. Your ping pong ball is not going to go straight ahead. But that's okay too. Yeah, my student cheated too. <laughs> um, Again, like I said, we use the float mats pretty liberally. We would use rings, noodles, whatever, to do some upper extremity work and, and pull them around the pool with them. They had to maintain sitting, tall kneeling, quadruped, a variety of positions. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, the question was about having the number of kids in the pool that we did um, and the noise and the activity causing problems with that many kids. Surprisingly, no. Um, in spite of the shrieks and squeals and, and we did have, I'll, I'm going to share a case with you at the end, um, they would kind of look and then they'd go back to what they were doing and then they'd look and they go, and I'm like, great, they're paying attention, you know, I'll take it but it never really set off a behavioral chain of events that became a problem. Um, and the other thing that, that we've worked with the parents a lot on was we did have a pretty, um, it wasn't strict behavioral code, but it was if you're not going to participate, then you're getting out. <laughs> and the parents backed us up on that. And we actually did have, I had a two-year-old in the program, and one day he just decided he wasn't doing anything we wanted to do regardless of choices that we gave him, or you do this and then we can do your thing. No, nope, wasn't having it. And we said, then you're done. And he said, okay, and he climbed out, and then turned around to get back in the pool. And dad said, no, you're done for the week. We'll come back next week if you want to play, but we're done. And we walked him out the door. And <laughs> you could hear the protests in the hallway, but it, it's that kind of consistency that we need to be giving all kids, not just, but that worked really well. Depends on their interest. Uh, repeat the question. <laughs> She's going to be throwing things at me in a minute. I know it. Um, how do you get the parents involved? Depends on their level of interest. Um, some of them we have right in there working with the student with their child. 
doing the activities, helping to move their child on the float board or playing ball toss with them or doing some of the other activities that we were doing. Um, some of them wanted to hang back a little and say, just call me if you need me for behavior reinforcement. Um, we had another family that had two children in the program and then twins on the deck. And so she stayed out. <laughs> um, was very receptive to everything we gave her about her two sons who were in the program and has gotten some support through volunteers and ABA people and that kind of thing to keep going with it. Um, but it really depends on the parent, honestly. Um, this is a video. <laughs> this is probably the one that would be more difficult to do at a public pool, but it was interesting to see how the students dealt with it. Um, we strung a rope, <coughs> nylon rope, across the pool and had them do both supine and prone hand over hand pulling. And I don't know if you saw the little bit, but if you watch, she can do maybe two, and then it's this way instead of hand over hand. She just, it took a lot of cueing to get her to do that hand over hand piece to get her to pay attention to what she was doing um, and really motor plan that. So that was something we used a lot. Um, I took out a video that I had of a little girl in one of the earlier series who decided that instead of doing, she would walk. And that was how she got around it. We're like, mm, no, Katie, try again. Um, we got them involved with each other. So when we did have more than one child in the pool, like the young lady doing the ball toss, we would have them ball toss to each other. So they would have to cue each other. They would have to make eye contact with each other. They would have to recognize that that object is coming towards them and that it has to go back. Um, so we did do some interaction with them whenever we could. Um, this was red light, green light with splashing your student. So they got to kick and splash as much as they could to get their, their teacher wet and then stop when they said red light. Um, so again, following directions, looking at that bilateral coordination um, and competing <laughs> with the kid next to them, plus the fun of getting your grown up wet. Okay, I'm going quick now. Um, rocket blasting, again, this was like the jumping, only it's in, in supine, so they're having to move backward through space and push off the wall. It's kind of scary for some of our kids. They do not like moving backward through space in a lot of cases, and so getting them comfortable doing that um, sometimes took, okay, I'm gonna be right behind you at your shoulders, you have to push with your legs, okay? I'm not gonna float you away from the wall, but as you push, I'll make sure you stay safe. And then once they figured out that they were gonna go straight back and they weren't gonna go under or they weren't gonna you know, end up in a position they didn't wanna be in, they were blasting across the pool. And so it got some lower extremity strength going, it got some of that backward space movement happening, um, which was, again, a, a very nice thing to see. Which, water, yeah, that's the water. Yeah, it's just the water moving out of his way. <laughs> um, we are not swimming lessons. Having said that, we do work on some components because bilateral coordination is a big part of that. And so this young lady, again, she, she had no hip extension. Um, any of her leg kicks came from hip flexion, knee flexion, and knee extension. She could not get that. And so we did do a lot of work with her. Um, we put floats on her thighs to try and get her legs up. We blocked with hands under her thighs to try and get the kick to happen in hip extension and not a bicycle movement. Um, working on arm things with her, the students came up, she was all about food. When she got in the pool, she started talking about what she was gonna have for dinner when she got out of the pool. And so they were like, pizza, one of her favorite things. So they were talking about, okay, we're gonna do arms. Spread the sauce on the pizza, spread the sauce on the pizza. And she'd go across the pool, spreading the sauce on the pizza. Um, and so then it was putting together arm and leg strokes that went, um, and she did okay. So with the eight and 10 week programs, we did take data. Um, and I'm gonna rush through a little bit because I wanna show you this kid at the end. He's my favorite. Um, we used a tool called the WODA, which is the Water Orientation Tool of Aylin. It was designed by a physical therapist in Israel. Her name is Ruthie Tirosh. And if you um, blow up <laughs> the slides that you got on the disc, her reference is in there. Um, and if you look at that article, her contact information, her email is in there. You can email her. It's a very inexpensive tool to buy. It's like $30 or $40, and she sends it to you. 
Um, there are two components to it. There's a one which is for more severely impaired folks, and then there's a two which is for folks who are more high, high functioning. It's based on Hallowick principles, so it's movement through water, getting in and out of the water, comfort level, all of those kinds of things. And then the higher level also gets into swim strokes, although we really didn't end up using that portion of it. We also use the PEDS-QL because I'm one of those qualitative people. <laughs> and so we wanted a quality of life measurement. The challenge is with this population, getting them to fill one out on themselves is almost impossible. Um, so the PEDS-QL does also have a parent component for different age groups, and there is a neurological one. So you can talk to the folks in France if you're doing clinical research. They will let you use it for free um, and email it to you and give you all the scoring information and everything. Um, if you're not uh, doing clinical research with it, they will charge you quite a bit. <laughs> Um, we did them at the beginning of the program. We did them at the end of the program. Out of the three years, we have 23 participants who have full data. We had about 30 go through, but some stopped early or didn't fill it out at the end or something got lost. Um, what was really interesting, I, with this small a sample size, I couldn't run good statistics. So I looked at minimum detectable change. Did the change in the score exceed what I would, nor what I would see just randomly? And MDC for the WODA, I believe, is 11.5. Um, and 21 out of 23 of them exceeded that greatly. <laughs> Only two of them did not. And they were two of our lower functioning kids. Uh, and they were really close. One of them missed it by 0.5, and one of them missed it by 1. Um, we did have, there was a couple of years where we ran a 10-week session in the fall and a 10-week session in the spring. And we had three participants who did both. <laughs> They were really gung-ho. Um, what was really interesting with those three kids is we still saw a change in the second 10 weeks, but it, it was not huge. Um, and so that kind of gave me the impression that there could be some initial benefit to getting a program going, and then getting them going on their own would be just as beneficial as having them come to therapy. Um, with the PEDS-QL, you're looking at a decrease in scores, unless you invert the scores, and then you're looking for an increase, but I just left them alone. Um, 14 out of the 19 that I had PEDS-QL data on decreased. But they were all over the place. And it has home functioning, school functioning, community functioning. And it was really random where the change occurred for every child. But the overall scores did decrease in a lot of these kids. So their parents' impression of how they were functioning changed. Now, I know there is a lot in the literature that talks about parents' impressions of kids with disabilities being very different from those children's actual impressions themselves or actual situation. But this is what I got. So um, this is kind of our overall. We did have really limited carryover with families, which is why we've gone to the three-week session. So they come in for three weeks. The first week, we get to know them, figure out what they need. The second week, we come back with a basic plan that we try out with the child and the family, see what works, make adjustments. The third week, they get laminated cards with pictures and activities written on them with a ring so they can take them to the pool with them. We finalize the program and we send them on their way. So that's kind of where we are now. And it's what's really amazing to me, the young lady that was doing the ball toss and the rope pull was a three-week person. We saw some pretty phenomenal changes just in three weeks, just anecdotally. Um, other things that we have found are verbal cues are very ineffective with these kids. Um, they, uh, our, my students' first instinct is just to tell them again. Oh, let's try it again. Do more, do more. Push harder. Go, go, go. They really respond to verbal, demonst to verbal. visual demonstration, modeling, watching someone else do it, or getting a manual cue from you as to where you want them to move. It doesn't mean we don't use verbal cues at all, but we really do try to minimize them. Because, and I think some of that is it gets overwhelming. All of the language gets overwhelming for them. Um, and that the higher functioning kids really loved the interaction. They were thrilled with being engaged with other kids in the pool and doing what they did and getting to, to participate in an activity that get, that kid gets to do it. Now it's my turn kind of thing. Our kids that were lower functioning, that didn't mean so much to them. Um, we did survey the parents afterwards and got some wonderful qualitative comments from them. Um, they saw improved confidence in their kids. They saw improved tolerance of water. 
which for kids who won't take a shower because the water's coming over their head is a pretty significant thing for these families as far as ADLs. Um, they saw improvements in core stability and coordination. I didn't measure those per se, but um, some of the things that we came up with equipment-wise that were a challenge, goggles. <laughs> the little tiny goggles were kind of problematic. So we found the half masks um, that were wider and went around the orbit of the eye, and they tolerated those beautifully. We called them their water glasses so that they could see. And they left them on and went everywhere, under the water, all over the place. Um, we did use some vests on some kids. We tried not to use flotation devices as much as possible, but we had a few kids who would not get in the water without them. And usually by five weeks in, they were done with it. They took the floaties off, they took the vest off, they were ready to go. And they were usually swimming underwater without a float at that point. Um, a lot of pool toys, but just target pool toys. I didn't go to a swim company and buy special stuff because the families don't have access to that. So we used ping pong balls and we used noodles from Target and we used blow up beach balls. Um, <laughs> I took one of our gym mats, our Eric's gym mats, <laughs> cut it in half and threw it in the pool. Um, yeah, shh, don't tell my daughter. Things that were challenges, some of the sensory processing issues. Again, we never had meltdowns. Um, but there were some kids who were a little overwhelmed at first, and so being aware of that and working on it gradually can be very beneficial and head off some of those issues that you might otherwise see. Um, the other thing that was a challenge for the students was we had participant ability all over the spectrum. I mean, they were <laughs> kids who were ready to swim underwater, couldn't get them on the surface, swimming laps under the pool. And we had kids who would not get down the stairs into the water, and we had everything in between. And so having them have the flexibility to be able to adjust and deal with that kind of on the fly. Because it could be one week the kid doesn't want to get in and the next week you're trying to keep them from jumping in before you're ready. Uh, I think it became a, a really good skill of my students to have. So it was a, a wonderful situation for them to learn in. We bounced from pool to pool. Um, pool temp was an issue, but I think we found a home now and we're very happy there. And as long as they'll let us stay, we're going to play. Um, the sound could have been an issue. And again, we're very fortunate in the pool that we're in um, that that's not a problem, but it is something to be aware of. Um, we talked about partnerships in that roundtable meeting. And I think that's pretty key to programs like this because I was able to partner with my students and that center to make this happen. And without those two components, it wouldn't have happened. So finding those partnerships in your community can really support something like this well. Um, I'm going to skip through that because I think I'm down to very, very little time because, <laughs> okay, when you say researcher, people's eyes glaze over, but when you say storyteller, they don't take you seriously. So now I'm going to do the storytelling side because you've heard all the data um, and it's more fun this way. This is Adam. Adam is 11 and he was our one participant that was a dual diagnosis child. He has both Down syndrome and autism. And I actually know Adam because I was his early intervention specialist when he was first born. So I worked with him from six months old after his heart surgery until he was two and a half when they left the area. And then they moved back to town about five years ago. And I had stayed in contact with the family, but I hadn't seen Adam until he showed up for this program. Um, he is nonverbal and very frustrated by that fact, but he's a genius with an iPod touch or an iPad. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't bring those in the water with us, but we found some other ways. He is very much a straight plane movement kid. He will move this way. He will move this way. There is no rotation. That's his frame of reference, okay? And he, he is very easily overstimulated. He, he would have been the one that I would have thought would have wigged out. Um, this is where Adam liked to hang out. And it's at the bottom of the ramp. Come here, mouse. And you can see he just moves back and forth along the wall. And I'm comfortable here, and you're not going to get me to go anywhere else. <laughs> Now, the other thing, I don't, you can't see it, but there's a light right here. We had to turn that light off because if it was on, he would just stand there, stare at it, and rock. That was his comfort point. So we turned it off. What we had to do was get him to the center of the pool. And so we physically took him to the center of the pool. Now, what you can't see is that his legs are wrapped around her, clenching. And every time she tries to move her arm to reposition, he's like, nope, you're hanging on. You're not letting go of me. But we got him out in the center of the pool in those first few weeks and tried to get him to let go a little bit, to look up, 
to get used to moving in rotation and keep him very contained so that he felt safe, even though it wasn't his comfort zone. Um, they're trying to work on some ball toss here, even if it's just pushing it back and forth. And he did let go and throw, and now I'm going to hang on again. And so he was probably one of the more challenging children for my students to problem solve. But they had a blast. Um, after eight weeks in the program, Adam was putting goggles on his face and jumping in. He was allowing himself to float and barely hang on to her shoulders, and he was having a good old time. And this is a really bad video, and I'm going to apologize for it right now because it came from Dad's iPhone <laughs> because my camera battery died that day. And I was really ticked because we got some great stuff, but it's hard to see. So I'm going to apologize right now, and I will try to narrate through it. <coughs> Come on, mouse. There you go. And what I want you to see is this is Adam in the middle. Okay, He has his same two students working with him. They are working on getting him to kick his legs. He's barely holding on to the student in front. And you'll know when he does kick his legs by the reaction of the student in the back. And so every now and then she's kind of cueing at a foot or at a thigh or at a knee. And there he goes. And she's excited. And they keep going and he's doing it and we get a double fist pump. And a triple fist pump. <laughs> because just that level of follow through was pretty amazing. And then he decided, I can do this, and started jumping off the wall into the pool to his student. Boom. The challenge was not to let that get too repetitive, because he probably would have done that for an hour if we had let him. Um, so we did three or four, and then we said, OK, move on to something else. Promise we'll come back. But he came from fearful of getting in the water to really ticked off that we made him leave, which was a lot of fun to watch. I hope I'm on time. <laughs> Any questions that you guys have? I did not, the question was, are we looking at any language acquisition measures? Um, I did not build any of those into this pilot. But anecdotally, we saw the same thing. We saw, if not language use, a lot more vocalization while they were in and after they got out of the water. Um, and, and I think it's very possible that that, that needs to be measured as well. It's kind of, I, I do a lot of work with hippotherapy as well. and I think. These two modalities impact a lot of different areas. You're getting social interaction. You're getting language stimulation. You're getting fine motor. You're getting gross motor. You're getting thinking and learning. Um, just because it's such a dynamic medium to work in. And so I know that um, some of the ABA folks were interested in looking at that, and we're looking at a collaboration with them. But I don't know if that will happen or not. It depends on time and energy. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Back of the room. She was asking about um, that other studies have not shown improved eye, eye contact, but have shown a decrease in self-stim behaviors and improvement in tolerance of being around other people, those kinds of things. Anecdotally, yes, yes, and we did see an increase in eye contact as well. Um, wasn't something that we measured. Again, it was a small pilot that we had to run over three years to get enough kids to even start to look. Um, but I think depending on the activities you use, how you structure them, and the kids that you get, 
you can see all kinds of different things come out of this. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. for autism? Yes. Uh, there weren't books. There were a few other studies, and most of them looked at group interaction. Um, I think the autism research is just starting to emerge, although if any of you were here for the um, gentleman from Belgium, the statistician, he apparently knows about a whole lot more research on autism and aquatics than I do, so I'm going to start digging again. Um, a lot of it was group-based. Um, a lot of it was run by ABA. It wasn't necessarily motor-focused. Um, but they were also seeing improvements in social skills and attention and interaction using the pool as a medium. Yes, ma'am. Why, why did we choose eight to ten weeks? Um, because we're on semesters, <laughs> and that's when my students are a captive audience, and to be able to do testing a week pre and testing a week post, it had to fit into a 16-week semester. Um, honestly, the first segment of this was run during the summer and I had them for eight weeks. That was all I had my students for. So it started there as a convenience and we expanded it a little to see if longer time, because we used different tools on the first summer as well and they weren't sensitive enough to change to show any effect. And so we changed the tools, we also changed the length to see if both of those things might show us a difference. And then we went back down to eight weeks with the new tools and still saw a change. Um, and anecdotally, you know, I'm seeing changes in three weeks. They're not as dramatic, but we are. So any time you can spend, I think, is worth it. You'll get better bang for your buck with a little more. Yes, ma'am. So how do the parents follow through? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, this particular pool is open to the community, and so they can buy a punch card where it's, I think, $5 for the child and $6 for a caregiver, um, which for some of our families is cost prohibitive, uh, but for a lot of our families is doable. We have um, YMCAs with pools all over town, so even though our community pools are closed, if they have a Y membership, they can take them there. And we tried to set up the activities so they were things they could do at a Y, at a JCC, um, at the one community pool we still have open or coming here. Um, so they had a lot of options. And one of my groups that helped me out uh, a couple years ago, part of their project was to put together an activity manual. And in the back of that manual was a list of all of the pools in a tri-county area so that the families would have a list of where they could possibly go. Yes, sir. Has continence been a problem in your population? Has continence been a problem? It has not. Now, I did have a two-year-old who was pre-potty training, and the pool rule is you must wear a swim diaper. Um, a lot of our kids were really good about giving us a frantic toilet sign when they needed to go, and we got them out and we took them. Um, I'm sure we had urinary incontinence, but we never had any, any problem with any others. Yes, ma'am. Do we have a speech therapy program? We do not. There is one in town. Um, and I am doing some adjunct work for them, and a colleague of mine there is a very good friend, so we have had some discussions. There is also an ABA master's program at another university in town that also has an OT program. So again, we've got a lot of opportunities for partnership, and I'm hoping that we can keep this going. I'm sorry. I've been given the high sign that we're done. But thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it.